we're getting uh, nearer to the to the end of this this event, but we still have my favorite session plus the closing uh, by by Stavros in a while. But my favorite session is the one when we tr we, we we get a chance to hear your ideas about uh, what we've been presenting so far, and when we try to answer questions or or collaborate at least in uh, uh, in answering questions. So this is what will happen in this in this hour that I'll, I'll be chairing. Uh, it's split in two. So for the first half hour, um, we're going to look at some of the questions that have been uh, raised mainly in the morning. But of course, I haven't I, I had a look at the at the chat, of course, during the, this session, but I see that most of the questions have already been answered. So if you have other questions uh, that have not been answered and that concern specifically this session, please, of course, ask them now and, and we'll add them at the end. Uh, but I will start with some of the questions that were asked this morning. So I'd like to know, first of all, if uh, Lorenzo Musetti is with us, because the first question uh, was raised basically during the during the poll uh, and Lorenzo uh, there, there was a great interest in understanding better what a, what a knowledge graph is uh, so if you could tell us a little bit more about that or even give us an example sure. so um, I can I can even show you a little bit of, a, of, a, of what a knowledge graph is um, let me share my screen you know knowledge graphs are based we could say an explicit representation of a domain of, an, of knowledge in this case. So for instance, knowledge graphs that are associated to NLP technology to understand text, they represent the word knowledge. So when, when we teach uh, you know, um, NLP and how our technology works, we usually you know, sort of compare you know, the multi-level NLP analysis engine as uh, you know, the brain's capability to understand, while the knowledge graph is basically everything that a human learns up to when it gets to university. So it contains a huge collection of concepts, words, synonyms, and the connections between these concepts, you know, give the possibility to the engine to actually leverage context and the understanding of these concepts for understanding text actively. So for instance, if I say tiger right now, what you know what pops up in your mind is the picture of a tiger if i say white house you're probably going to see you know the government house of, of the us government right so it's not your brain is capable of understanding that white house it's exactly that thing and it's not just you know a white colored you know building so this is basically how you know uh, a knowledge graph represents knowledge so for instance this is this that you see is one of the production development products that we have. So this is not, you know, it's not going to be a very graphical representation, but at least you see the actual products that our knowledge engineers and linguists use for building algorithms for classification and, and extraction. And as you see, for instance, the knowledge graph is meant for addressing the difference between the adjective airport, like an airport, you know, steward. So in that, in that case, it's still the same name. It's the, well, it's still the same word, but it's an adjective and it means something different, differently. But, you know, airport, for instance, is a, is a different type of concept, concept. It includes different synonyms as well. And, you know, the connections uh, between airport and, for instance, being a building complex, uh, you know, creates this hypernomy type of uh, relationship. So that, for instance, it basically helps the system understanding that an airport is a type of building complex, which is, you know, and, and an airport, for instance, can be an airport or a heliport. And there are additional types of semantic links, for instance, that associate uh, the airport to specific buildings that compose an airport. Now, if you imagine a huge amount of links and connections between all these concepts, all of this sort of simulate and reproduce the way our brain is capable of, comp uh, let's say, processing contextual information around text. So if you read a nuclear science type of you know, paper, I'm sure that many of the things you will not understand, but you're still capable of uh, providing every single word the meaning, you will still be able to um, recognize an article and dis distinguish it from uh, a noun or a, or a verb or a, prop a person name, for instance. So 
basically our technology chose, well, you know, expert AI chose to go this route. There are different types of technologies. Others would leverage machine learning and deep learning and neural networks. We chose to, you know, go in the direction of building technology that does really reproduce the way our brain works in terms of natural language processing. Thanks a lot. Thanks a of lot, uh, Lorenzo. And I, uh, there was a, a short uh, clarification question from Leah, I think, who asked, uh, is this similar to WordNet? It is, to some degree, it is similar to WordNet. Um, it, it is, you know, it's close. So mm -hmm. WordNet is something very close to our knowledge graph. What, you know, what makes the huge difference is, you know, the structure, the configuration, and how we do leverage the knowledge graph in our technology. Right. And I, if I may add, uh, Lorenzo's company has been investing on human intelligence for many years. And unless someone does that, we'll never have a comparison to, to, to artificial intelligence, right? Because it would be too costly to start now. So uh, that's something that's really, really um, needed and, and useful to have a, a, bench, a, 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 benchmark, a quality benchmark, let's say. Um, so thank you very much, Lorenzo. And uh, thank you. Um, I will, uh, I've asked a colleague here at the, at the University of Bologna to, to uh, take the other question about uh, MTA engine adaptation and evaluation. Uh, so if Federico is here, and that because that was the third uh, least um, known or understood topic from the poll, I will leave the data stewardship out because that's clearly a, a not well known uh, profession in general, so that, that would need a lot of uh, more more uh, research and, and apart from the uh, the presentation familiar from this morning. So if Federico is here and would like to um, say a little I'm bit here. about how you uh, create um, or adapt an engine. Thanks. Sure, thank you. All right, so uh, adaptation of machine translation. Um, the deal is usually we adapt something for a specific domain. Um, and we need, of course, some training data. So we need a parallel corpora. And the idea is that we need a few thousand sentences in that domain already well translated. Um, ideally, we would need at least 10,000, but there have been good results with even less. And so the idea is that you pick a platform, an engine, an MTE platform that um, allows you to do adaptation. Um, Google and Microsoft are two good examples. Modern MTE is an Italian MTE that is very good and does a different form of adaptation that is a little more um, hidden, let's say, because it doesn't, doesn't actually create a separate engine for you the same way. Um, it adapts while you are doing that and while you're uploading TM access. So it's kind of interesting in that way. And you know, there are a bunch of other products, I'm not going to name them all. Um, not all the MT that are commercially available um, allow for adaptation. And the deal is you train a system, and the idea, uh, which, which means you use a, base, a basic general system, general purpose system, and then the platform itself creates a different version that is adapted um, to your data. And usually, what it means, you also need to have test data, so you, you take typically about a thousand sentences, again, parallel, parallel corpora, right translated, and you measure a score in one of the automatic systems that exist. So you can immediately get the measured impact of, of your data. Um, usually works, but it's not a guarantee. Sorry, a cloud just passed by. Um, it's like everything else, in, in machine translation, some domains work better than others. So typically when the sentence structure is very repetitive, so manuals of all kinds, technical documentation works really well. And it's actually a very good tool because especially when you have technical documentation that uses very specific terms or a very specific translation of a term in a technical sense for that particular domain, then adaptation works great and solves a lot of problems, makes really the life of the translator easier when they do post-editing because they already, typically they tend to pick the right terminology. Um, if you have a text that is highly creative, uh, which doesn't necessarily mean literary, can just be marketing, um, some business services that are typically sometimes difficult because the language and the sentences change all the time. 
at that point, adaptation might or might not work. And that's also, those are the areas in which MT right now doesn't work that well. Um, and as usual, it all varies. You know, quality of machine translation is never absolute. There is no such a thing like this engine works better than the other in all contexts. Um, you can find online there are several companies that do uh, surveys yearly or more. There are at this point about 15 commercial engines that are all capable of translating between um, 50 to 60 languages, all of them. So all the possible combinations. Uh, so they're all the same capabilities at the basic and they all have different performances. So some are gonna be better in this language pair in this domain, some are gonna be better at this other one. And in general, that's it. That's actually an interesting thing for a translator. Uh, a professional translator in a 21st century needs to know how to evaluate MT, needs to know how to adapt MT. And um, because then if you work for an, either for an agency, for yourself or for a larger company, you need to be able to devise a strategy. How do you do, how do you apply machine translation in your context? or for this particular client, if you're an agency, so you have a different one every time. And so you need to be able to, to keep an eye on this service, do some of your own experiments, and every time suggest the right strategy. Typically, you might need two to four different MT engines to achieve the best quality in a domain uh, for a group of, let's say, up to 10 languages. And if you're doing all 50 languages, because you're really working with a large international clients that work in a lot of different markets, uh, then again, you might need more engines or you might need to have a heavier customization or you might need to invest in your own MT engine, which is also possible. Great. Well, thank you very much, Federico. I think this gives us, uh, you know, uh, 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 I think, a clearer perspective on yet another profession that um, has been added to the field together with technology. I mean, technology certainly takes away some of the jobs, but it also adds some more. So the evaluation of machine translation and client uh, and also reporting on um, so writing reports on machine translation and then telling clients what they should or should not use and, and what kind of, of uh, engine or, uh, or engine can be used or whether they should rely on, on human translation because it's simply not worth going through the effort of adapting a machine translation system to then post edit the result because translators don't like to post edit and if they don't like it then they might not do a good job so all this kind of, of uh, advice is extremely valuable and it's something that certainly linguists or translators are better at than than engineers. So, okay, thank you very much, Federico. So I'll, I'll move on. We have uh, about 10 minutes for, for the other questions. And another question that was raised this morning had to do with, uh, with sociolinguistics. Um, and in general, I think I would like to sort of open up a bit to another topic that we were surprised that would not be very prominent in our uh, needs analysis, which was working with human subjects. So in general, uh, polls, questionnaires, or uh, experiments with, with human subjects, uh, they did not appear very prominent, even though we were expecting them to be more prominent. So I wonder if this was, was because of how the, uh, our, our needs analysis was designed, which is quite possible, uh, or whether it's these kinds of jobs are not done by linguists, which is another possibility. So I wonder if, if any of the speakers or anyone from the audience has any, any ideas about uh, other topics, related topics that were not covered, that were not discussed this morning. If I can mention just another one is, uh, we, we didn't discuss spoken data and accessibility of spoken data very much. That was also, I mean, it was there in the, uh, in the questionnaires and the job ads, but not as prominently as we would have expected. And I have a feeling that it could be because, uh, because it, there might be, in that case, more need for engineers than linguists. But then it's, it's just a hunch. I have no, no support for that. So I don't know if anyone would like to, uh, to talk about you know, these areas that do not seem to figure very prominently in the in the needs analysis. Tanya. Your mic, yes. Yes, it's been a while. 
Um, so yes, this uh, question about collecting uh, judgments uh, and in general uh, working with uh, with the human subjects, I, I think it's a little bit outside of the horizon of um, of, uh, of what people think are the sources of data. Let's say like that. And so it might be also uh, something that has to do with how we designed our survey because we actually started from ads, right? And ads, they already have, you know, the ideas that are there in place. And I think that they so, sort of limited the, the horizon. And I think that, you know, like, yeah, there is this uh, general, general idea that we all have language in our heads, right? So we know language or maybe we study it. And so, and so I think people don't understand uh, enough, you know, that the, the, the knowledge about language also comes from asking other people, what do you say? <laughs> and often you get surprised. So that would be just uh, my thought, you know, and so I'm not sure how to overcome this. Thanks, Tanya. Hank and Adriano. Hank, your microphone. Hank von der Neuvel from Radboud University speaking. I'm a speech technologist uh, here. So I was uh, triggered by your remark on uh, speech data. And indeed, um, um, we see many engineers working in the field, um, but we also see that um, firing a linguist doesn't always help. Um, uh, because when it comes to really insight in, in, in how things work, and especially when we talk about, say, atypical speech, where you deal with people uh, learning languages or having lost languages due to a pathology, you need insight also in how, uh, how this works. And you can do things with technology, but knowing how the language works also helps a lot in uh, modeling your speech recognizer. Um, and I think for students uh, working with a speech and the more so with video, which is also a relevant component when we talk about linguistics in the end, um, knowledge about um, the rights of data subjects is an important thing. So when it comes to data management, um, um, sometimes it's easier, say, to anonymize a text, but you can't anonymize uh, audio. Yeah, you can do it with, with beeps and so on, but still it is uh, personal data because the, the voice is still there and the same goes for a video and even the stronger when you um, do um, research into sign languages where you cannot blur faces because this is an essential element of the language itself so i think it is indeed relevant that um, uh, input uh, from uh, linguistic students is needed, but also in the context of what language is and what the personal aspects of languages are. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Adriano, could I just comment on, on Hank's um, um, point here? Because uh, last week I was at, at uh, an event organized by Clara in Italy, uh, where several companies were saying that one of the great needs in the industry uh, is for um, spoken data that are not clean not too perfect so with with noise with and and so all the collection of data uh from say a conversation multi-party conversation uh and collection and treatment of that data is extremely valuable to the uh to the, to, to the speech industry or, or language industry that deals with speech so that's another area where um i think it's uh, it's valuable to have linguists collecting data from from humans thank you adriano over to you yeah, I, I agree with Tanya that the way we collected the job ads might have skewed the, the successive results. And when you look for language data, for example, on LinkedIn, usually you end up um, finding jobs that have to do with written language data. The other uh, thing that, that we noticed is that when you deal with speech in the kind of job ads that we saw, um, you often find jobs that have to do with transcribing a spoken language data or video data. So the impression might be that linguists have a job where you work with text and in order for, to, um, let's say, manage or deal with speech uh, data, in fact, you work with transcriptions of speech data. That might be one possible explanation. Thanks a lot. I'll just move on uh, to the, uh, the 
and then I'll leave the last question about the annotation, that, which has already been uh, answered in the chat, but we'll take it uh, from there as well. But there was another question that I said this morning we would address, which was the one, what I call the passion versus, versus reason conflict. So I, I love languages. I want to study languages, but then I'll be without a job. Right. So the, the, the branding problems that we also discussed or briefly mentioned in the morning of language degrees where uh, students don't go to those degrees because they feel that the only possible career is as a teacher, maybe as a language teacher, and then there won't be students going to you know, to, to study languages. So, uh, so it will be very unsuccessful. Um, so the passion versus reason conflict or compromise, which is probably a better, um, a, a better word for it, that was raised by Frida Sturz when she asked this morning about uh, that there are jobs for people who know German, but our students want to study Spanish. Uh, but there was also an, an, um, a question asked by uh, Christine Marie Lunardelli, who asked, what would your research say about student motivation to study languages and linguistic uh, in, in a BA or master's program. So we didn't really tackle the question of motivation, but this is something that I don't know if, if any of the speakers uh, would like to answer this question about, about motivation. We feel that adding components that uh, allow you to find a job and, and, and a good, uh, reasonably well-paid job as well uh, is, is a good, is a good uh, add addition to your personal motivation, but there may, be other, there may be other reasons that we could add. So I don't know if you have any thoughts about, about this point, about how to raise a student's motivation to study languages. No, yeah, so... Basically, yeah, Tanya, thanks. Oh, just to start again, uh, the discussion, I, I think that, well, I don't know what's your impression, but I don't think that there is a lack of motivation for people to study language. At, at some, somehow people get in, interested in languages and they go on to, to study them, yeah? So I think that uh, now, you know, to talk about motivations, it's really uh, probably farther away. So I think our question is really, what do we do with people who decide to study a language? And uh, so that then, you know, so then they find themselves, as you mentioned, in this, uh, like, uh, yeah, uh, um, impasse. Uh, <laughs> so, um, and maybe I want to just give an example of myself, you know, like I really wanted to study language because I was really interested, I was passionate, I wanted to understand how it works, and I still want to understand how language works. And, but already at the time I wanted to study it like from a scientific point of view, and this is what I couldn't do, like, you know, I wanted to study language. The only way to study language was like arts, right? And so that was that was the thing that um, also motivated me now to try to, to change a little bit this perspective. So to conclude, I don't think there is a problem. I think people are interested in languages. There is this passion. So the only problem is like what to do with this passion later. <laughs> Yeah, but then uh, Peter's point in the chat, I think, is 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 true that that the numbers are really really decreasing because there's there's also I guess political pressure and and families uh, so, social pressure on students not to uh, to go on to a language education or language career for the reasons that we've been discussing this morning, which means that maybe if a student has a passion for languages, they'll go on to do I don't know, engineering and then leave that passion as, as a side thing. Uh, so indeed, maybe finding ways of, 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 re of making passion and interest or passion and, and, and career uh, work together might be, might, you know, be very, very okay. necessary, I'd say. Okay. Uh, yeah. I didn't yeah. have this insight so. about the decrees. My personal impression mm -hmm. is that yeah, there's no shortage of students. <laughs> right. So subjective. Um, I, d I don't think we have time for my, my well, actually, just, just one moment, and then we'll move on to the, uh, uh, to, to the uh, breakout rooms. Uh, the, the, there was a question in the morning about employment models for annotators. Certainly annotation and, in general, data, working with data, uh, was one of the points that, were, that what came back repeatedly. So this question has been answered in the chat, but I, I was wondering if uh, anyone wanted to say a little bit about um, 
th these jobs as as data annotators or or data analysts uh, what we expect them to become in the future whether they're just you know small jobs that you do as as uh, which is you know it, it's fine anyway but um what we see as the employment uh models for for these kinds of jobs um and also where we find them <laughs> because they might be an entry point also for other kinds of job, which is connected to another question that was in the chat uh, for Maya mainly about the four profiles and whether we see them as incremental uh, with the language data um, analyst going on to become a language data scientist. And in, in general, uh, what Maya sees as the level of seniority or experience that uh, distinguishes the two. I think Maya mentioned it a bit uh, at the end of her talk, but maybe we can say a little bit about this to conclude yes yeah, so it does seem from what we got from our needs analysis that there are these different levels so two of the sub profiles being entry level profiles that probably people can do straight out of the ba so the language data analyst and the language data manager while the language data scientist and the language project manager might require either some experience in the field or perhaps uh, an, at least an MA degree or a PhD degree. So in, in any case, a bit more uh, knowledge and experience in the relevant in the relevant areas. Now, these are, as I said, these are just very general profiles and sub profiles. So it's not necessarily the case all the time that it goes this way. But you know, it seemed to us that there is a seniority distinction in the industry as 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 well. Brief. Uh, shall we move on? Uh, I guess yeah. I think we're all eager to to. You're all eager. Tired uh, to finish the show. Uh, I'll just spend a couple of minutes wrapping this up. Let me just. So basically, uh, the, the, the aim with this multiplayer event, and I'm actually really happy to, to report that uh, I think it has been a huge success with a lot of interesting interaction. And as I said, in uh, probably joking around before, but I think that this could be a report on its own. Like what transpired in the discussions today is, is so interesting and so helpful, not only for us, but also I, I'm sure for you too. Uh, uh, the event was about, you know, everyone who has an interest, a vested interest and expertise in language, uh, how, how does the job market work with regards to them? Uh, so I'll just very briefly, um, I think that the potential take home message, at least from our perspective, when it comes to the project of upskills, uh, is that there are three ways in which we can um, help uh, in a certain way. Uh, first of all, uh, we feel that uh, by doing the needs analysis and continuing with creation of learning content and especially modular content, that people can mix and match according to their particular courses, uh, we should be able to, uh, to contribute to uh, preparing students better uh, for the industry. Uh, then uh, another thing that I think was really, I was fascinated by the reaction, uh, especially in the second poll, uh, it seems that there are many, many, many options uh, out there for students. Uh, and uh, we need to spread the word that it's not just teaching or translating or I don't know, you know, having a computer and uh, doing annotation work that's out there. There's so many fascinating routes and paths, career paths that, that uh, people who are interested, who have studied linguistics or languages uh, can take. And I think that it's important to also make this point to academics uh, rather than just, you know, students and the industry as well. Um, and also, uh, I think it's also, we can also play a role in raising awareness about what Adriana actually just said right now, right? That, it's, it's, it's actually easier to train a linguist to become a technology person or a digital person or whatnot. So we're talking about um, a field that is versatile by nature because it combines both theoretical aspects, uh, you know, human experimentation, computational stuff. I mean, everything sort of matches up there. So I think um, there is a lot of potential here as well. Uh, with regards to your potential take home message or your input in the process, um, here we've gathered some uh, thanks to our super efficient team, we've gathered some of your uh, jams in the jump boards. Uh, so basically, the, we, we can identify, I mean, these are not in order, but I think that there are some patterns uh, in a way, you know, uh, people are interested in language because they want to understand how language works. They want to be able to communicate better and help people uh, communicate better and more successfully. Um, uh, then 
um, uh, to work with them because I believe, yeah, so yeah, it has to do with communication among people. Uh, there is also a very important cultural element. So we can build, languages can build bridges between people and help us understand our differences, uh, engage with new cultures around the world. Uh, uh, and also because they can help open up the mind. Like if you understand the language and you understand linguistic differences, you can also see a different perspective about the world. Uh, we have this very, very important, in my view, comment as well by Peter from Belgium, uh, but we need to also support smaller languages because, you know, the way things are going, you know, the digital age is actually here. It's not, not long, no longer coming to us, it's here. So uh, words need, all languages need to be protected in this regard. Uh, and, oh, I think it was, yeah, there was another one, uh, another slide here, sorry. Uh, linguistic diversity, again, cultures, um, uh, and some people are also, you know, uh, happy to work with inspiring people in language and linguistics. And this is also important because we want to also focus uh, on, on giving a better learning experience to, to students of languages and linguistics. So uh, we've managed to gather all this stuff and we've managed to make this, I, I think, a success um, because of the commitment of, 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 of the whole team. And I would like to use this moment to, to really thank all partners of the consortium for their stellar work in preparing for this. I need to especially thank the University of Bologna uh, team and the Clarinary team uh, for the University of Bologna for organizing uh, this fantastic event and thinking of all uh, these amazing people we have with us today uh, and Clarinary for taking uh, care uh, way beyond their line of duty of, of technical aspects and also um, communicating through Twitter and whatnot. Uh, I, I also think we need to extend our thanks to our funding body, uh, uh, the European Commission, so the Erasmus Plus program. Uh, I'd also like parenthetically to thank Movetia because you know, we have partners because of them too. Uh, and it's this funding that enables us to reach out uh, to more people. Um, and of course, most of all, this wouldn't have happened unless we had interest from your, from your end. We were actually thinking it was going to be a small meeting uh, registrations really exceed expectations, and I think that you know the take-home message for me at least is this lovely thing here, right? Happy people, happy faces, and all that. Uh, thank you very much for joining. Before I sign off, I would like to also uh, uh, divert your attention to our um, to our project website. Uh, there, all the information about the needs analysis and all the reports are in there if you're interested. And there are many more exciting things to come. Not least of all, as we've mentioned, we, we will create an inventory of existing online material uh, for teaching linguistics and language uh, related sciences. Uh, and we will also you know, upload uh, data from our needs analysis and all that uh, free accessible obviously to everyone. So uh, keep coming back. Uh, on another note, I think that we will also try and establish some sort of newsletter or a mailing list so that we can uh, send out any information about new things that are happening once every two or three months. And uh, of course, you know, uh, you will get all the updates if you uh, sign up, uh, if, you, if you join us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter um, too. So I think that uh, that is all uh, from my end. I would like to thank everyone for their kind participation and the interesting discussion. Mm -hmm.